I'll tell you throughout the hour uh, a little bit about uh, only a couple of slides on the regulation, uh, the recent stuff that uh, Ray mentioned. And I'll talk quite a bit about the, the packing problem, which is the stuff that we're working on recently. So what I thought I'd do, um, I should say, this is uh, um, people who are involved. So a lot of the work is done with uh, Senator Mullenathan, who is an economist at Harvard. Uh, we have a, a, an organization called Ideas42, which does sort of applied behavioral research on policy issues, ranging from uh, dispute resolution to health to finance. And you're invited to go on the website and see what's going on, and also to help us and, and collaborate on research. And a lot of the work I'll talk about today uh, is with a couple of uh, colleagues, Michael Barr, Marin Bertrand, and a few Princeton students who are actually currently still at work. And what I thought I'd do, since I assume it's a somewhat mixed audience, is give you sort of an overview where we came from, how we got to what we're doing, and how our agenda and our vision of what's most um, relevant to thinking about decision making among the poor, how that's shifted with time and, and how we think about it today. Uh, since I assume some people have almost no behavioral background, I always do my three slides of uh, Psych 101 Express, just the basic stuff that you have to understand uh, impinges on how we think about things. Uh, probably the most classic uh, of all, which is sort of entered popular culture, and all of you know in some form or another, but I want to give you my version of it, is uh, kind of a Milgram study. So these are uh, European psychologists who come to the US after the Second World War, and of obsessed with understanding what made the German mind the mind that it was. They run uh, a battery of very impressive studies. Uh, to preempt the finding, they find out, of course, that there's nothing German about it, that we all have this sort of mind. and. Um, they find things they did not expect. But to give you one specific example, this is Milgram's study at the, at the uh, basement of the Yale psych department. He invites middle-aged men to participate in the study. They think they're assigned randomly to participants and to teachers, to learners and to teachers, but they're all going to be uh, teachers. The learner, the student, is a confederate who gets attached to electrodes. The subject, the teacher, goes on the other side of the partition. And he gives the student sort of silly tasks, like paired associates. I say, shoe, banana. Later I say, shoe, you're supposed to say banana. If you get it right, we'll move on. If you make a mistake, I'll give you a slight electric shock. In a machine that looks like this, they get progressively higher in the shocks that I give you, if I choose to give them. The whole thing is very carefully choreographed. So in the initial errors you make, I give you small shocks. They get substantially higher. The, the learner, the confederate, starts screaming high, louder and louder. Get me out of here, I told you I have heart trouble, which he happens to mention when they meet. Then there's screams of agony. At 3.30, if you go high enough to 3.30, there's, uh, uh, there's silence. And if you say, shoo, nothing comes back, you either give the shock or not. Then it's 3.40, 3.50. And if you chose to, from 3.30 to 4.50, there's nothing coming back anymore. And you either give the shocks or not, etc. This is a close-up of the machine. Now, the, the real beauty of the study, what Milgram did, is he, inter he interviewed people and asked them to predict what will subjects do. Um, they got a much more faithful description of all the details of the study and, and asked what would people do. And the finding was um, everybody predicts disobedience. The average prediction was 135. That's when the grunts get sort of loud. Uh, no one predicts that anybody will go above 300, except for the psychiatrists, the experts in human behavior you know, in the 60s who predict that one in 1,000 will be the true sociopath who would go to, one, to 450. Um, what did uh, Milgram find? He found that 65% were sociopaths and that everybody goes to 300. Now, there's a lot of things one can say about this study. Um, first of all, notice it's a discovery about human behavior that's 40 years old. The ex we know, for a fact, the experts did not know this. If you look at Milgram's correspondence with the NIH, he's stunned. He planned to find the opposite. Some of you follow this. Uh, this was recently replicated actually on French TV with a lot of fanfare and, and, and drama. Um, once you know it, it ought, once you take Psych 101 or once you take the Psych 101 Express today, next time you read about Abu Ghraib, it ought to come immediately to mind. This is not about horrible people. It's about average people in a very bad situation. Um, and we know it's just very hard to incorporate into who we are. So we, most of us now suspect that we, after all, would not be doing this sort of thing. Even when we incorporate it into our understanding of human behavior, I can tell you myself, we still don't get it. Um, I'm not going to spend much time, but if I had more time, I'd ask you to describe this scene. Uh, these are 
lovely young women on a day off from running the gas chambers in Auschwitz. Um, so, you know, we just can't get it. And uh, probably the number one finding, Barbara? There's a chair. So probably the, the number one summary of, of modern social psych from Milgram on is how powerful the situation can be and how we just don't, don't, don't get it. We tend to discount it. There's an, initial, uh, an additional lesson that I think is profound. It's more for those who are in the kind of econ behavioral discussion, which I think is interesting. And I always try to emphasize this is not intended to be a, a deep postmodern fact. It's supposed to be a really, really trivial observation. When you ask people to make a decision, say a choice between A and B, we assume they're choosing between A and B in the world, between job one and job two. In fact, the only thing we can do is choose between those two jobs as they are represented in the three pound machine that we carry behind the eyes and between the ears. And we have a lot of the data that that's not one to one. And so the whole idea that people choose between things in the world, if you think about it, although it sounds simple, is extremely courageous. And so all economic theory is based on a wild assumption that I have one to one correspondence, which, I, which we rarely have. And if you think about it, most of the framing effects, you know, most of the context effects, you know, all have to do with the fact that the same thing is represented slightly differently and leads to very different decisions. And this relates here because, of course, and I should say this, the subjects in this experiment we know are not sadists. They are, there are films of them doing this. They're begging to stop. They're crying. They're scratching and itching like monkeys. They get up. They sit down. They beg to stop. They're not liking this. Somehow what they're representing to themselves when they do this is not what you just saw. There's some other construal of what's happening that I'm not sure any, any of us has understood to this day uh, that, that underlies this. And a lot of behavioral research, a lot of it is about construal, how we represent things, whether it's linguistically and survey research and perception, everywhere you look. So that's where we started when we said um, we're doing a lot of work in decision making, particularly uh, with Sandal Munathan. What's happening when people try to understand the decision making done by the poor? Now, decision making in poverty is a very rich area. I I'm not going to be able to describe all of it, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. And the idea that we started with is there's a very specific context, a very unusual, very heavy context that underlies poverty. Would that help us understand the things that we see that otherwise seem puzzling or baffling or, or just plain mistaken? Uh, just uh, as a aside, uh, poverty in America, in some sense, if you chose to, you can consider this a magnificent failure of, of our society. So th this is probably the most advanced and richest nations of all times. About something between a quarter and a third of our people are basically living in poverty. So uh, current estimates that are 40 million are below the poverty line. The poverty line, for those of you who are interested in that sort of thing, is a number that hasn't been adjusted in 50 years except for inflation, but it's severely misleading. Most organizations that study um, sort of the living wage, what it would take for an American to live a minimally acceptable American life, arrive at the conclusion that the, the minimum wage is roughly 50 to 60 percent of what you need. If you adjust for that, there's about 80 million Americans who are living below what is required for a minimally acceptable American life. And on many other measures from, by the OECD and others, uh, we're truly uh, an embarrassment. Recent, ex recent estimates, 90 percent of African American kids born today will spend at least one year below the poverty line, i.e. half of the minimally acceptable living wage, and about 60% of Americans more generally. And poverty is no doubt a financially, but also a culturally, socially, psychologically special state. And a lot of the agenda for today that we've been focusing on is what does that look like? Now it's remarkable for the psychologists in this room, it's remarkable how little contribution has come from behavioral scientists in an attempt to understand poverty uh, in modern times. So if you look at the poverty uh, literature, it basically has two dominant um, views that, that dominate the discussion. There's a rational choice view that all of you know well. And there's pathology view that says, no, the, the poor do not do costs and benefits and maximize as best they can given their circumstances. Instead, they're rife with wrong values, mistrust, so myopia, lack of understanding, discount, excessive discounting, et cetera. That's the general view. 
And if you come from where we were coming, you know, Milgram and everything that happened since, uh, there's an alternative obvious proposal, which is what if the poor are neither terribly rational, since we don't think most of us fit that description, nor terribly pathological, just plain human, functioning in a complicated context. What if we look at it that way? So we'll focus on the context of the poor, assume they're fallible and misguided, like most of us tend, seem to be when we study us carefully, and let's see if that helps us make sense of puzzles that otherwise um, seem very surprising. So let me give you an example. If you take the unbanked, so about 25% of households in the US do not resort to standard banking mechanisms and services. The great majority of those are very poor. And it's very bad to be unbanked. It's also very costly. So the typical household who's unbanked spends about $300 a month on basic services that you get for free, like sending checks. Um, and so the question is, why would you be unbanked? The rational choice analyzer, explainer, says, look, the, the, the poor have done the costs and benefits and decided the banks are too far, the accounts are too expensive, it doesn't pay off, it's just not worth doing. The policy implications is, you know, you have to, you know, Community Reinvestment Act, you have to move the banks closer to them, you have to subsidize the accounts, you have to do what you can to change the costs and the benefits. The pathology explainer says, well, no, they really just don't trust banks. They don't like banks. They don't understand the value of savings. And, you know, we have to educate them and their children. And financial literacy, I can tell you, in D.C. is an enormous industry. Um, but there's an alternative, which is what if the poor, like we proposed, they get it and <clears throat> they're not pathological. They're not banked for whatever reasons. Let's say, for example, they don't like interacting with banks. There's a lot of research coming from the Federal Reserve Bank and many other places. If you're a young man and black walking into a bank in Trenton, the guards all get up and get ready, and it's very demeaning. There are women who describe how they don't have a babysitter, and walking into, into a bank with screaming babies, everybody gives them bad looks, and that's very unpleasant. What if that's a reason not to have a bank account? <coughs> now, if you're a good economist or policy analyst, you'd say, look, I, I don't get this. You're saying they they understood the benefits of banking. They understood the lifetime implications of having a bank account. And they're not doing it because of you know, 20 minutes of unpleasantness in the bank? And the answer is exactly. That's what we propose. Because that we know this about human behavior more generally. So for example, physicians who tour the country giving people lectures about the importance of self-exams, breast self-exams for women, testicular self-exams for men, you ask them, those who teach us, you can't teach them anymore. You ask them, do you self-exam? Well, not always, not why. Busy, forget, not fun, and they don't always. Now, if these physicians, highly trained, expert, understanding the implications for you know, life expectancy, fail to do this you know, for 15 seconds in the privacy of the shower, it shouldn't be so surprising that an American who's poor decides not that they're not going to be banked, but that that half hour in the bank, they'll do another time. And you know, time passes, and life goes on. And so that's sort of the proposal. Um, to look at that sort of idea, we ran a, a study at the Center for Economic Progress in Chicago, who um, during EITC, the, poor come, the working poor come to fill out their taxes, they get help. <coughs> if they don't have a bank account, uh, the Center for Economic Progress give them a spiel about how important it is to be banked, and are told, Shore Bank, north of the city, is available for you. Please go and open a bank account. It's a fairly successful program. Almost half of them do. There is then a lot of problems I'm not going into now because they open the bank account, the refund comes, they grab it all and leave the account empty and dead and Shorebank is unhappy, but we're not going to go there. Let's just look at the tendency to open the account. Almost half of them do. If you call them, which we did, over 90% over say, yes, I like the idea. Why didn't you open the account? Bus, babysitter, forms, the usual. So what we did here is, this is very trivial, but what we did here is on random days they had the standard spiel about going to Shorebank. On other randomly selected days, there was a representative from Shorebank sitting in the corner of the room, very receptive, very welcoming. You're invited to go there and start the proceedings. You still have to go to Shorebank, so transaction costs have not been reduced, but you start the process there, and that has a, a substantial impact. The impact of that minor manipulation was greater than the difference, for example, between those who came to this event out of their own choice and those who were forced to go by, the, by their uh, employers, etc. Notice this is inconsistent with family values, with this distrust of banks, nothing. It's just a, what a social psychologist would call a, a channel factor. It's a small introduction of something that eases something, and you get people to do things that they wouldn't have done otherwise, 
in ways that are you know relatively trivial. It's you know a lot of things that you many of you I don't know exactly where you are from, but the things you've seen things like Save More Tomorrow. So these are a lot of programs that we are implementing today to help people save. You don't change their values, you don't change their wealth. You just implement a little trick in terms of where their money goes and when that leads them to do things they couldn't do before or weren't doing before. More generally, if you think about the context of the poor, again, it's not just that going to the bank is unpleasant. It's that life is rife with unpleasant, stress, demeaning, complicated moments. And in the social psychology literature, I mean, your provost here did a lot of very important work on, on identity threat and stereotype threat among African-American kids. You see African-American kids in schools, there is a stereotype threat that makes it hard for you to function because of how people feel about you. You can do a small affirmation manipulation. You make people feel, the students feel a little bit better about their abilities. And that seems to have long lasting implications. They're finding a year and a half later, they're still performing better after a small affirmation manipulation intended to make their identity uh, more, more palatable, more pleasant, more able. Well, if you think about the poor, my, my colleague Susan Fisk has a lot of work on this. You know, there are places where it's not good to be black, other places it's not good to be Jewish, places where it's terrible to be gypsy. Poor and homeless is the worst everywhere you look. If you take a multidimensional space, the poor and the homeless are in the bottom left. They're incapable, unclean, untrustworthy, a disaster. And they know it. And so everything we know from social psych, that's going to be a very strong identity threat. And so let's try something very simple. So in this case, we go to, this is a, in a, in a, a soup kitchen, a, the Trenton area soup kitchen. These are people who come for a free meal. They're all very poor. At the end of the meal, we don't do the written version because a lot of them can't read and write. So we take them into our small private room where there's a tape. And by random assignment, they're asked to speak up to 60 seconds into this tape, either recounting a recent meal experience they've had, that's a control condition, or they're asked to describe a recent event that made them feel capable and proud. That's the affirmation manipulation. After they've done that, we thank them, we give them a little prize, and on the way out, there are benefits packages, EITC, Vita sites, different government benefits packages for which these people are typically eligible, and where the typical participant has not availed themselves of this benefit package. And we simply count how many of them, on the way out, take these relatively threatening forms that they've avoided so far. And what you find is that those who have been affirmed are almost three times more likely to walk away with the benefits package than those who have not. Now, I have no illusion that they will then apply. There's a lot of steps in between that we will not be there for them to help them. But if you just look at their willingness to take this benefits package, this form and walk away with it, it's tripled when you have affirmed them for 60 seconds in the privacy of a, of a, of a tape recorder in a room. So that seems to suggest just making you feel better makes you do things that otherwise the government finds it very hard for you to get you to do. Uh, we recently took it a step further. Um, again, this, there is super uh, uh, kitchen, very similar manipulation. You get a control or an affirmation manipulation making you feel more capable. And this time, we actually give you cognitive tests. We give you uh, cognitive control tests. We have to be quick and not make mistakes between pressing left and right levers depending on items on the screen. And Raven's progressive matrices tests, basically you know, GREs, IQ tests. And what you find is those who spoke for 60 seconds to the tape about how more capable they are than those who didn't perform significantly better on IQ tests or you know, something close to it. Okay, so you get very strong effects even on performance among people who have just been momentarily affirmed in the context of being very poor. All right, so that's where we were in the agenda of suggesting that there is a context of poverty and that exactly what would you would observe with any other actor you would find with them in the specific ways in which, in which the behavior is impinged by the behavior, by the context in which they function, a standard story. But then you get into behaviors, and that sort of kind of was a, a bit of a shift, I think, in our, in our agenda, where things seem really unique to the poor. There are mistakes that you seem to see that you think we would not make. So I'll give you an example. These are um, fruit and vegetable vendors uh, and flower vendors in India. I don't know if you can see this is Sandal. I don't know if you can see them over there. And um, the way these people work is the following. They get up at 4 in the morning. They go over to the person who sells them the fruits and the vegetables. They buy a thousand rupees worth of, of fruit or, or flowers. They go to the market. They spend the entire day 
and they sell the 1,000 rupees worth of stuff for 1,100. They go back, give the guy 1,050, get up at 4 in the morning, buy 1,000 worth, sell for 1,100, give him back 1,050. They pay 5% a day for 10 years on average, working extremely hard. Now, if you compute it for a moment, you see that if instead of a 1050, they gave 1060, or some other version thereof, within about a month or two, they'd be debt free, they'd double their income. So the question is, for 10 years, you're making this unbelievable move, paying 5% a day, why don't you get it that you can do something? That seems very unique, very extreme. Now, it turns out it's not so different from payday lending in, in the context that we know better. Uh, payday loans are extremely expensive. Um, people take repeated payday loans. Um, they spend a lot of good money on them. And on average, now the estimate is that when you take a payday loan, 75% of it goes to pay the former payday loan. So you get into this trap. The proposal I'm going to make, by the way, is that, so there's a lot of, you should know, there's a lot of uh, discussion in policy circles about whether we should outlaw payday lending, for example. I don't know where I fall on it. I think it's a complicated story. But what's very clear is that there are cases where taking a payday loan is not a mistake. I mean, if I really need the money enough that paying this interest is worth it for me, I may need it badly enough. There's nothing crazy about that. The suggestion I want to make is the problem is not that I need to pay the loan now, is that I got myself to the point where I need it. I, I did not manage to save anything or be in a point where a mild mini shock is something I can cover without resorting to the payday loan. So the mistake is really not taking it, but needing it. Um, and that kind of led us to think of poverty as a unique case in some sense, in that it's really about not having enough. And I'll try to explain to you what that means. Basically, that, you know, the, the real intrinsic aspect of poverty is not having enough money, which sounds sort of funny, but I'll try to give it some sense. So if you look at research on poverty, most of it focuses on correlates of poverty, on health, on crime, on education. And the question is, what is it that's intrinsic to the context of poverty that makes people act in a certain way when they're poor? And uh, if you look at research, it's very clear that, it's not surprising, that the poor live in a fashion that leads to enormous amount of hardship and failure recurringly and very frequently. And the line, the approach we want to take, what Ray mentioned uh, would be kind of the underlying story in the book in a sense, is that conditions of scarcity, just not having enough, produces a certain psychology. It's a specific, it's a very special context. Just like you know, Milgram subjects live in a special context, the poor live in a context, the unique feature of which is having enormous scarcity, not having enough. That generates a certain psychology and that psychology leads to behaviors that are otherwise puzzling if you don't get it. So that fruit vendor who's not doing anything about it, the argument is going to be she has so little, so little, that what she would have to give up, the marginal value of the thing she needs to give up to save more at a time, is phenomenally high because of the scarcity. And that sort of makes it look crazy, but in the context of enormous scarcity, it makes more sense. So I'll try to explain to you how this goes. The, the metaphor we're using is a packing problem. The idea is you travel with a suitcase. In this case, it would be your budget. I'm thinking of two people. One has a larger suitcase with some slack in it, some space in it, and the other one has a very tightly packed suitcase. I walk in the street and see a pair of shoes I like. I ask myself, do I like them? Is the price right? And if I like them, I have some slack in my suitcase. I throw them in. You ask yourself, do I like the shoes? Is the price right? And given that your suitcase is no slack, what do I take out of the suitcase to make the shoes fit? And the argument is going to be that sort of trade-off thinking is done constantly by the, by the poor. Almost everything they do requires trade-off thinking. It's distracting. It's depleting. It requires a lot of attention. It leads to error. And it makes you look less competent. So that's what's going to happen when you're constantly in the business of packing very small suitcases. So one, when you have slack, it's just easier to pack. Um, there's actually beautiful work in computational theory on the knapsack problem. It's an extremely close affiliate of this, where basically you have to decide whether it's NP complete or not to be able to, in, to fit a certain number of items in a small, limited space. And there's a lot of work on, that looks very much like packing. It's just cognitively easier when you have slack. Um, <coughs> problem complexity goes up. And it's much cheaper to acquire slack when a suitcase is bigger. So the marginal item you have to keep out when you have a lot of room in your suitcase is much lower than when your suitcase is very, very tight. 
you're going to have a lot more errors. So I just throw the shoes in. You have to decide whether you take out of the suitcase to fit them. You take out the raincoat. We get there, it rains. You're looking wet. And I don't. And you look like you made a mistake. And you're going to look a lot less competent uh, as a result. So that's sort of the, the intuition. Um, a couple of comments. So a lot of it underlies on the idea that the temptations don't scale. In other words, I can tell you in my daily life today, when I buy coffees, even expensive ones at Starbucks, when I buy books, CDs, I, I, don't, I don't do trade-off thinking. I don't think about what I'm not going to buy instead, what it's going to mean to me, nothing. And in that sense, economics is sort of misleading because it, it talks about the science of scarcity. Psychologically, I don't experience scarcity on a daily basis. The argument is going to be that the person who serves us dinner tonight thinks trade-offs on anything above a muffin. They constantly have to think, if I buy this, what do I not buy instead? If I buy this shirt, do I send my kids on a school trip? That sort of thing. So the experience of scarcity is going to be a lot more common because temptations don't scale. I experience temptations infrequently when things get big enough. For you, with such a, such a tight budget, such a tight suitcase, everything becomes a temptation. Um, another point that we can have a whole course on this, just briefly, there is a correlation between the size of the suitcase and its, and its slack, but of course it's not perfect. So on the one hand, if you want to be amused, at least I found it amusing, if you go back uh, 18 months and read about some of the millionaires in New York who are losing sleep over the fact that they might have to give up their fifth house in Chamonix, that's sort of comical, but they're experiencing enormously tightly packed enormous suitcase. So they have a really enormous suitcase, there's no slack. And when they take a, a hit, they no longer can finance everything they need. So that's the case with a very big suitcase with no slack in it. On the other hand, when you sit and talk to farmers in India, you get a sense for among many of them, the suitcase is very small and they're okay. There's no particular tension among many of them. There's enough slack for everyday life. So those are kind of the extremes. Clearly part of it is culturally determined, right? So um, this is kind of a classic, this is a classic critique that comes kind of from the conservative side. This, this man is, so you often hear the following. How can you call the people in Trenton poor when if you were them in India, you'd be a millionaire, you'd be a very comfortable man? And the argument is yes, of course, poverty is not just about starving, it's about living a minimally acceptable life in the context that you inhabit. So I think today, if you don't have a TV in America, you're poor. There's something minimally acceptable to be an American that you cannot afford. So this is interesting because this guy is angry about the fact that we're talking about these people as poor while they own color TVs, and as if they can even buy black and white if they wanted to, but in any case, <laughs> they have color TVs. And the argument here is, yes, that's right. I mean that. I mean, a TV is part of what it means not to be poor. And as always, Adam Smith did it beautifully, so you can see it here. <coughs> a linen shirt, for example, is strictly speaking not a necessity of life. The, Greek, the Greeks and Romans lived, I suppose, very comfortably, uh, <coughs> though they had no linen. But in the present times, uh, through the greater part of Europe, a credible day laborer would be ashamed to appear in public without a linen shirt. Okay, and so that's Adam Smith's point. There are things that, of course, other places, other times didn't need, but today not having them makes you poor. That's just to, to remind us that, of course, there is a culturally determined issue here, uh, and, that's, and that's critical. Notice also it can lead to absurdity. So because I'm using scarcity and poverty as a psychological notion, where you feel you can't afford the things you need, you know, if you develop crazy tastes, you know, if you need to have a Lamborghini, you'll be poor by that definition. Now, you know, I won't feel bad for you, as opposed to others, but you would fit the, 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 you know, some of the qualitative phenomena of what it means to be poor, and that's, that's right. Uh, okay. Um, so now, we'll talk to you a little bit about some of the elements of the psychology of scarcity that would be predicted from this, from this vision and how to go about um, exploring them or at least uh, investigating them in a lab or, or, or in natural studies. I'll cover only some of what we're doing, but uh, I know by the way this is called a conversation or a discussion, so I assume that means that you just, you wouldn't be rude to interrupt or something like that. So don't, don't feel like you're rude if you want to interrupt and I'll, I'll just go a little at a time. So um, one of the simple um, corollaries or, or implications of the story is that the poor are going to attend to prices, even to small prices, much more than the rich, because they're packing everything they need to know. And so we looked for a while for the right item. We ended up with uh, taxis, 
I think the text is pretty good because very few would argue that the, the poor write taxes more often than the rich. So that's good. So we go to South Station. We ask people for the self-reported household income. We just divided by median split. And we ask them, when you enter the cab in Boston, at what price does the meter start? And what you see is that those who are, you know, the, let's call them the poor, the low SES in, in South Station, are three times more likely to know what the meter starts from than the rich. Okay, so you know, you don't have a packing problem. It's like me buying coffees and books. I don't care if it starts from two or three. I get in the cabin, I wait till I get there and I pay them. The poor person needs to know what the implications might be. They're in packing mode, they're attending to prices. Um, more interestingly, this is a classic, you know, real classic uh, Kahneman Tversky type question. You might, if you know this literature, you know it as the calculator uh, jacket problem, but we had to adjust for inflation. So here it is, so a friend goes to buy an appliance, or you with the, both versions, uh, it's gonna cost either 100 or 500 or $1,000, and you can save $50 by going 45 minutes away. And the question is, would you go 45 minutes to save $50 on an item that costs 100 or 500 or 1,000? And the classic finding, this is a replication of the classic finding, is that people are more likely to go 45 minutes to save 50 if it's out of 100 than if it's out of 1,000. The standard critique, of course, is if you are a minimally normal economist, this 45 minutes, $50, either it's worth it for you or not, why are you doing this funny accounting? You'll probably be spending a lot more money today anyway. It's the same in all cases. You shouldn't show any differential tendency to, to, to move the 45 minutes. When you ask this in the very poor areas of Trenton, you get nothing. You get perfect economists. 45 minutes, $50, they say yes or they say no. The relative aspect is a luxury they don't have that we seem to have. Okay, so you basically lose the effect. They're good economists when those sums matter. Now notice is that, uh, you can also replicate this among the non-ultra poor, just the regular folks. Again, South Station, low SES, high SES. You get a similar effect on saving uh, 25 out of 800 or, or uh, 100. There's an interesting question here that's sort of unresolved. In other words, is it just the amount they care about $50 more than the rich, or is it a way of thinking? And I'm not sure what the answer is, because we replicate this with $500 with Princeton students. Now, contrary to stereotype, they're not all wealthy. More than half of them are in serious financial aid. And you, you're gonna buy a used car. It costs either $3,000 or $10,000. You can travel four hours to save $500. Propensity to do that is very, very different, depending on the ratio. Now, $500 for Princeton students, I'm not sure is that different from $50 for the South Station people. In any case, it may be deeper than just the sum. It may, may actually be a way that we develop a thinking about it. But in any case, when you look at the, at the very poor, uh, sorry, when you get, look at the very poor, you just don't get it, which is what you'd expect if what they're doing is, again, focusing on the value of, of packing or unpacking the item. If you ask people about trade-off thinking, do you think about trade-offs when you buy things? So I can show you the US and India and the US. Uh, the rich don't think about the trade-off when they buy a toaster or a TV as much as the poor do. The poor are engaged in trade-off thinking a lot more often as self-reported. In India, it's, not, it's interesting, the TV is enough to challenge, to trigger trade-off thinking among, bo among both rich and poor, but they differ on the mixer. So when it's big enough, when it's a Lamborghini, all of us do it, but somewhere it stops and the poor in all countries do it more often than the rich. So. Um, Two implications of, of scarcity here. One is that spending for the poor, very like I was saying before, everything becomes a luxury. And, and I'll, I'll pass briefly to talk a little bit about time, but the implication here is, here is the story. So the, the, the idea is that for the poor person, buying anything that costs more than, I don't know, a dollar becomes a temptation that they need to resist or not depending. And the argument I'm gonna make now is if you look at time, something very similar happens psychologically. So many people in this room who are not money poor are time poor. They have a problem with time of a similar nature to the one that the poor experience with money. So what does that mean? I have a very good friend who paints homes. And he works very hard from nine to six, and at six he's free until the next morning. And if you go to Chet and ask him, do you wanna to go to the movies? He says, do you wanna see the movie or not? Sure. If instead, I go to Barbara and said, you want to go to the movies? She says, is the movie good or not? And what was I going to do tonight that I wouldn't do if I go to the movies that I have to do another time? It's exactly the shoes in the suitcase. She has to think trade-offs. And the argument is, just like for the poor, anything that costs more than a dollar becomes a luxury, 
for many of us, anything that takes longer than I don't know how many minutes becomes something you need to contemplate. And that leads to pathology. So for example, I find myself sitting with my really, really fun, lovely daughters and thinking I could now be doing you know, some stupid thing at work. And if you think about it, if a normal way of being is to be with your daughters, my time poverty has created a luxury or a temptation out of something that should have been completely normal. Just like for the poor person, it shouldn't be a temptation to buy breakfast. For me, it shouldn't be a temptation to spend an hour with my kids. And it has become that because of the poverty in, in time in this case. Um, yeah, so that's, that's part of the story. Um, again, to emphasize, part of it really has to do with the fact that the things are not proportional. So the, the temptations we experience differ as we get rich and poor. So I'll talk a minute about time. This is kind of fun. So if you think about packing time as compared to packing money, trade-offs are very similar, as I just described about spending time with your kids. Temptations are very similar. All of us say, I shouldn't have committed. What made me agree to give the stock you know, four months earlier when I thought it would be fun to do? There's something about it that's funny. I'm, I'm always amused when they call you and say, would you give a talk next year on June 16th? And you open your calendar, and I always think to myself, what do you expect to find next year on June 16th? It's go you're going to be available. What are you looking at? And the insight here is that what I'm doing when I say yes is I'm complicating my packing of June 2011. Of course now I'm available. It's that suitcase, it's the packing of that June that's being made more complicated now. That's the idea. But very similar mistakes when the poor person misplans their finances and finds himself with not enough having taken a loan or committed. Okay, I'm going to skip some of these luxuries I talk about. This one I really love. So, a lot of the angry critiques, again, from the right say, look at these poor people. They have debts that they cannot afford, yet they buy luxuries. Now this, and it's, by the way, this is an interesting story, again, about understanding context. So um, if, imagine you're a mother of two living in the Bronx, and you finish the month with $60 in your pocket. It's a question of minutes. There are a lot of beautiful books, by the way, about this in recent years. It's a question of minutes before your mother, your sister, your best friend genuinely needs that money, for real, for things that matter. And in fact, they give each other money much more than we ever will. If you finish the month with $60, you can wait five minutes until somebody needs it, or you can save it by going buy your kids sneakers. And what you find, the critique always saying is, look at them, instead of saving, they go and spend it on, on luxuries. There's another perspective that says, the only way for them to save is to spend it quickly. So that's just apropos. But more generally, the argument is you have debts that you cannot maintain, that you cannot fulfill, yet you're buying luxuries. You know, my question to you, I suspect everybody here is sitting on time commitments that you, cannot, that you know you cannot respect, you cannot abide by. What are you doing schmoozing with me today? <laughs> and this is, this is exactly the same psychology, because right, you can save another hour, do another two lines of your paper, or you can do something else that seems to have some value. That's what the poor are doing. And so part of our agenda, if we, do the, if we can pull this off, is if nothing else, to create some empathy between getting cases where we understand that we fail in funny ways and understanding how others do it when their poverty is you know, in a different domain, but otherwise quite comparable. OK. Um, <clears throat> let me tell a bit. OK, so this is, I'm going to give you a couple of studies now. It's a little bit hard to create monetary poverty in our subjects who are not poor, although we, we, we have some ideas. But uh, for now, we're going to look at, at time poverty. I'm just going to take students and make them time poor and see what they do. So these are, uh, in this case, Princeton undergraduates. We have other studies. But in this case, these are undergraduates, uh, although some of it is also done on, on the web. They're playing a family feud game. So they're going to have to answer certain questions about, you know, in this case, the category is uh, things that you have on the patio. Those who have very low time slack get 15 seconds per round. Those who have high time slack get 50, five zero seconds per round. You, you, know, you have a, a, a counter that shows you how much time you have left. And depending on conditions, you can save time. So you can finish this round early and accumulate points to use later for more rounds. Or you can borrow time. You can use more time now and have le less time later. And in the conditions where you can borrow time, you can either borrow at no interest, so every second you take extra now, you have one second less later, or you borrow at high interest, where every second you take extra above what you're allotted in this round now, you have two seconds less left later. So you're paying high interest. 
Uh, if you look at the time banked, the rich, those who have the highest back, 50 seconds around, save bank more time than the poor. Not surprisingly, they have more of it. Uh, the poor borrow a lot more than the rich. They just don't have enough around, so they're borrowing a lot more. And more importantly, and this is to me the most interesting part, oh, the rich show a clear sensitivity to interest. If interest is low, I'm much more likely to borrow than if interest is high. The poor do not show it, at least not significantly. I need time, I'm pressed, I need a few more seconds, I borrow. Highly insensitive to interest rate, which is, you know, should remind you exactly what happens in the financial world when those who need money show a sens certain sensitivity to the interest rate. As a result of that, because I'm borrowing at high interest rate, I complete less rounds. So this is no, uh, no, not allowed to borrow. You can borrow at no interest, or you must borrow at high interest. I complete less rounds, and I do less well. They're playing for points, which get translated to $50 if you score in the top 10%. Uh, 10, 10 so there's some incentive to do well. And as I'm forced to borrow under time, lack of time slack, I pay higher interest rate, I play less rounds, and I score fewer points. Not only that, but notice, allowing me to borrow does nothing to the rich, but allowing me to borrow hurts the poor compared to when they can't borrow. Okay, so it's very much, that now, this is an argument for outlawing payday loans, of course, that should, we shouldn't rely on this datum alone, but there is clearly a sense in which, if I'm stressed under enormous duress and borrow indiscriminately, giving me the chance to encounter payday lenders in the streets can hurt me relative to if they were not there. Which, of course, is independent of the fact that sometimes they can save my life. So it's just, just to say that. Um, we did another study where, the, where now the points you get per guess in the game go higher the more you guess. So you get one point for the first correct guess, two points for the second, three for the third. There's an enormous incentive to borrow. But borrowing becomes very salient. It's very clear that you're borrowing because you get greater payoff as you wait. And what it's, it's interesting because what you see here is now the poor are sensitive to interest. The interest rate is high now. It's three to one. They're clearly more, more sensitive than they were before. The rich just don't borrow very much. And again, they're sensitive, but insufficiently sensitive. So they still hurt their performance by borrowing, even if they're more attuned to it, because borrowing is so costly. So again, uh, they end up hurting themselves. Um, Another type of study, if you look at just consumption that's either smooth or comes uh, with, with windfalls. So those in the low slack, the poor, either get 15 a, a round or they get 15 and occasionally 45, which if they were to divide appropriately would lead to more 15, so that they're really identical if you divide it well. But if you don't, if you use too much of it, then of course you have too little left for future rounds. And same for the rich, except it's 50 now and 150 instead of 15 and 45. So the logic is the same, you just get more. Um, and again, what you see, I think there's a better way of running this, what we're trying to now do now, because if you think about it, the real way to do this is to have these be lower than 15 and then higher rather than the same. This, this, we're in a sense, we're helping them. But in any case, what you see here is once again, those who have enough time, whether they get it in predictable units or with windfalls are able to divide it well enough that it impacts their performance very little, not significantly. Those who are stressed for time, if you give it to them irregularly, are hurt by it. They're overused the richer periods. So it's, it's exactly like getting your pay on a monthly check or depending on crops. If you get it depending on crops, you fail to smooth well enough if you're poor. If you're rich, you're fine. You, you take care of it. And that also affects not just rounds completed, but points earned. Same thing, the value of making sure that you get your income on a monthly basis goes up as the income is lower, because it helps you manage what otherwise you're managing under stress and managing less well. Now, of course, lurking behind this, by the way, and it's a different discussion, these are mistakes, as it were, committed by very sophisticated players. In other words, you can't say here that the poor just don't think well. These are, you know, Princeton juniors and seniors. So that's not the problem. That whatever is coming up here that's showing a failure to do things well is not because of, you know, myopia or lack of education. Okay, um, another kind of study though, I'm just gonna throw a few studies at you to give you a sense. Um, these are people in a, in a mall in New Jersey. 
regular shoppers who agree to participate in the study, uh, they sit in front of a computer, we present hypothetical financial scenarios that, that present difficulties that you might encounter. As you're thinking about the scenario and how you might take care of it and resolve it, which you will tell us in a minute, we'll give you sort of fun things to do that look like things you've seen already. You get the, oh, you get um, these uh, cognitive attention control tasks about pressing left and right depending on whether the flower appears or not, et cetera. And you get these Raven's matrices where you have to decide which one fits in here, kind of IQ tests. So you do this kind of stuff for fun. And after a few of these, we'll go back and you tell us how you're going to solve the financial problem you were presented with. These financial problems, let's call them this way, come easy or hard. Hard is when your car is going to cost $3,000 or 1500 because of insurance to fix. And easy is when it's going to cost 300 or 150 much easier in terms of how you're going to go about taking care of this hardship. By the way, I don't know if you've seen this recently. There's a survey that uh, Peter Tufano at Harvard and some others did. Uh, this is a big nationally representative sample where they ask people, taking into account your possessions, your wealth, your friends, family, et cetera, would you be able to come up with $2,000 within a week? And 46%, no right or wrong, 46% say no. So $2,000 for many Americans is a lot of money. And so here, there's 1,500 you have to come up with to take care of, which we know is a hardship, or 150. You play these games, and then we see how many errors, how well you did on these cognitive tasks. And what you get is that those who think of the hard problems do less well on these cognitive tasks than, than, than those who think on the easy problems. So you know, you have, a, you have a medical hardship, you're driving less well. This is cognitive attention tests, because you're preoccupied with a problem that's much more taxing than the easy one. If we divide you by self-reported wealth into rich and poor, the effects are significant among the poor, not so much among the rich. So the rich don't care so much if it's 1,500 or 150. The poor really do, which is just what you'd expect from the difficulty of packing. Um, there, a lot of this work on the poor, of course, there's a clear confound between your wealth and your levels of education, et cetera. So uh, our dream is to do a within subject study. This one failed because of the weather. <laughs> and it was very costly, actually. But the idea was this. <laughs> the idea was this. You, you take, um, for example, Indian farmers who harvest uh, sugar cane. If you harvest sugar cane, you have harvest once a year. Most of them are unbanked. They fail to smooth, as we saw earlier which basically means the majority of them are relatively poor before the harvest and relatively rich after. So the idea was we can go to them and run these tests on them, on the same person, three or four months apart, catching the same person, same level of education, same value, et cetera, when they're rich and when they're poor. And can we get these effects on, on their ease of packing, et cetera. Now it was, we worked hard because um, a lot of the kind of the Stroop tests, for example, that we like to run, require that you be a, a professional reader, a, a very good reader, that you automatically read things, but a lot of them don't read. It turns out that Steve Cosland at Harvard has produced this Stroop test for relative illiterates. So you see four sevens, and the answer is four. And your automatic system, when you're rushed, wants to say seven. So we had handheld machines for these farmers where we gave them Stroop tests that are not depend on, on, on language, et cetera. Anyway, uh, there were hurricanes, typhoons, the, the crop, nothing. Didn't happen. We have some data, but very little, and we hope to do it again. But the idea, at least, I'm selling you is, is a nice one. Um, OK. I want to have uh, some concluding remarks. Maybe we'll have some discussion. The, the, one of the lessons is there's what we're calling the irony of poverty. In some sense, the poor are facing computationally more taxing problems, just more difficult facts they have to resolve. They have to resist more temptations. They can't afford the mistakes they make. And they're in a worse position to do all that. And that comes for many reasons. Everything from health to education to all the correlates that we know people study, all of whom, all of which show the poor are, are experiencing more difficulties than the rest. And um, I think a lot of society, we'll come back to the, to the policy issues in a minute, but a lot of societal <laughs> attempts to ease your packing, we have much more of than, than they. And I'm using these in a very vulgar way. But those who are not poor, have much more of those uh, than the rich. And what do I mean by that? So if you think about it, scarcity and packing are not just a function of what you have. It's also 
how easy or hard it is made for you to pack. So if you think about the smoothing the regular as opposed to irregular income, those two subject, those two groups were equally rich. They got the same number of points, same number of minutes, but they got them in different ways. And the argument is that those who got chunks of 15 in a predictable way had their packing made easier than those who didn't. Those of you who have their income deposited automatically into the banks have an easier packing problem than those who don't. And that's sort of remarkable. I mean, to this day, there are programs among the poor. Uh, there is a youth bill. There's a program that's, that's subsidized by HUD where you, if you save money, it's matched sometimes two to one, sometimes three to one by HUD, helping young uh, kids, young Americans sort of develop enough money to start a business or go to get education. It's an enormous amount of money spent. Clearly, the intention is good. In many places, they pay you your weekly or monthly fee and wait for you, the 16-year-old kid, to come and give some money back to put in savings that will be matched, as opposed to just have it deducted automatically. The difference, I don't have to tell you, is enormous. And that's, that's scarcity. That's ease of packing. We haven't changed your wealth. But in one case, the ease in which you are able to do certain things is much greater than another. And so that's sort of an interesting story. If you look at microfinance, for example, I'm not an expert in microfinance. There's some much bigger experts here. But I know that one of the issues that are interesting is that microfinance institutions are very proud of the fact that they're often very rigid in their compliance demands. If you think about it, if you take scarcity seriously enough, it's not obvious that's the thing to do. Because if you're trying to help me, being very rigid, you know, forcing me to run get a payday loan so I can pay you back in time, is not a way to ease my packing. So the argument here is that scarcity is a function, one thing, of how much I have, but two, ways in which society, friends, myself, insight, planning, whatever, help me pack it well or not. And that's where uh, some regulation and other issues uh, can really come into play. And that's, uh, I'll just finish with this stuff that uh, Ray was mentioning. So Michael Barr uh, is now the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, and he's very, uh, you know, a big fan of behavioral stuff. And so we looked at some of the issues that arise from behavioral studies that might impinge on, on, on regulation. Um, so one thing that's kind of obvious, that's sort of true for we all know, the whole idea of a, of a competitive market is sort of fundamentally based on the assumption that you're trying to satisfy the tastes of a wise chooser. So competition is good because we're all trying to satisfy your choice, your taste, and you're wise in choosing. If people don't choose well, all bets are off. Right? So we know that over 1,000 banks offer credit cards. People seem not to weigh enough the interest rate because they don't plan to pay it. As a result, banks don't have to compete on interest rates. In fact, they sort of avoid being the lowest because that attracts just the people they don't want. And the whole thing unveils. So unravels. So a lot of the issues here is how to think about regulation, taking into account behavioral rather than rational decision makers. I know some of the things uh, we looked at. Um, I won't get into the details, but let me give you just one example that's kind of interesting. So take a classic human fallibility, like the failure to compound. So people underestimate compounding. They don't understand what compounding does. If you underestimate compounding, you're going to overborrow and undersave. Because right? you're going to undersave because you don't see the value of savings, how, it's gonna, how compounding is going to help you. And you're going to overborrow because you don't see the compounding threat that accumulates if you borrow for too long or too much. Take that simple fallibility. Now, what's the, what's the strategic interaction between the firm and the individual, between the regulator and the bank? In the case of savings, people undersave. We want them to save more. The banks agree. They'd like you to save more. You know, if you give them your money, they do good things with it, they think. So the regulator and the banks agree on the idea that letting you, helping you save will be good. And in fact, it's been a big victory. We have all sorts of default savings arrangements, uh, retirement savings arrangements. Relative victory because the insight that people could use help to save was endorsed by the, by, the, by the banks. Take borrowing. The regular wants you to borrow less because you're overborrowing because you don't understand compounding. Banks are not so impressed with this idea. And there hasn't been a single success because banks are not so interested in collaborating with the regulator in having you borrow less. And so the idea here is that behaviorally insightful regulator will have to focus their attention on areas where we know you'll get buy-in and cooperation from the firms if they understand the situation. And areas where you won't unless the regular steps in and does something more. That's, that's sort of the, the, the flavor of that project. 
Okay, I, I wasn't interrupted, so I ran quickly, but we can talk now. Thank you. Thank you.